Normandy, in autumn 1944. The tumult has passed. The great armies have come and gone. The Canadians have been there, and 20,000 have gone no further. 5,400 have been killed, 13,500 wounded. Some are prisoners, a thousand of these since the first paratroopers were captured on D-Day. Including the heavy losses in Italy, Canadian infantry casualties in 1944 were alarming. Defence Minister Ralston had heard rumblings of deep trouble that fall and was in Europe. As the old soldier moved sadly among the wounded, he was briefed. Do you want the official version they asked or the truth? He asked for the truth and it was shocking. The reinforcement situation was very serious. Half-trained men from other branches were fighting as infantry. Still, the reserve pool could not be filled. Ralston demanded an explanation. An error in calculation, they said. Heavier infantry casualties than anticipated. A drop in volunteers. Dismayed by this information, he remembered King's promise, conscription if necessary. A shaken but determined man brought a political bombshell back to Canada. The specter of conscription was about to rise again over Ottawa. Mackenzie King listened as the coal statistics were laid out by his defense minister. King had said, not necessarily conscription, but conscription if necessary. The time, said Ralston, had come. The conscripts now serving as home defense must go and fight. Here was the issue which had split the country in 1917. King saw the gaping wound reopened. He saw the fall of himself and his government. To much of English Canada, the conscripts were derisively the zombies. But to most of Quebec, the principle of voluntary enlistment lay deep. The cabinet, too, was split. Chubby power opposed conscription. Louis Saint Laurent was not yet convinced it was necessary. Also opposed were Ian Mackenzie and James Gardner. In favor of immediate conscription were Thomas Crerar and Angus L. MacDonald. Impatiently drumming for some action was C.D. Howe, who would side with the conscriptionists in a showdown. James Ilsley, the powerful finance minister, also argued strongly on the side of Ralston. Conscription, they said, was now undeniably necessary to fill the ranks of the army. But, said King and his bloc, conscripts were not necessary to win the war or to save lives. It was too late in the day to split the nation. For 10 days it continued, and the country was sensing the turmoil. As compromise upon compromise was discussed and rejected, the prim, starched figure of the Premier played for time. Finally, his sure political instincts told him his time was up. November 1st, the Cabinet began again the desultory and forlorn attempts at reaching agreement. King listened for a time, and then coldly dropped his dynamite. He recalled that Ralston had previously offered to resign. The resignation would now be accepted. The cabinet was stunned. The country was jolted. The new defense minister was General Andy McNaughton. A year earlier, McNaughton had relinquished command of the Canadian Army but he was still the respected embodiment of the Canadian soldier. McNaughton believed he could raise the reinforcements by voluntary means, and he had three weeks to do it. The general appealed to his old officers and his country. As regards reinforcements, I have declared my faith that the only practicable solution lies in the maintenance of our traditional system of voluntary enlistment. I believe in obligations of honor voluntarily taken up 
and I intend to use my best efforts to encourage and to lead. Once again, the Army combed the ranks of the home defense conscripts, urging them to enlist for overseas. But few of the conscripts responded. They would go if ordered, they said, but not voluntarily. Time was running out when officers of Pacific Command, under sanction of General George Perks, told the press they could not raise the volunteers. November 22nd. The tension mounts as Parliament convenes in Ottawa for a session that many believe will see King's liberal regime come tumbling down. A new coalition government would send the conscripts to fight. The Conservatives are confident. John Bracken, the leader without a seat, and his men on the floor. M.J. Coldwell's CCF will help bring down King. King tells the House McNaughton will speak the next day and then retires to Laurier House for final fateful meetings. For the Liberal cabinet that night in the East Block, it was the 11th hour. King knew he must now play his last dramatic card. Next morning, the papers speculated on how McNaughton could defend his voluntary system. But unknown to them, and to the people who lined up to watch the great political downfall, Andy McNaughton had received a final report from his military advisers and was rewriting his speech. King knew his crowd. The tough political genius was never more masterful than on this day. McNaughton carried a speech that would destroy his political career but save the Liberal government. Promptly at three, King's witching hour, the House sat to hear McNaughton. Quite calmly in the hush chamber, King tabled an order in council sending 16,000 conscripts overseas. McNaughton then performed his about face. The volunteers, he admitted, were not forthcoming. Conscription, after all, was the only answer. The press gallery had a sensation. The conservatives, they reported, were happy at the news, but politically, they had been beaten. King, by yielding, had stolen their thunder. The crisis had been averted. His government was safe. Chubby Power resigned from the cabinet on principle. But Louis Saint Laurent had been convinced that conscription was now necessary and remained. The rending hatred of 1917 did not materialize. Many of the conscripts were quietly integrated into the lines. The people yearned for other news. They wanted to escape, and they did with Barbara Ann. In the last months, victory was inevitable, but elusive. Canada, like the world, was weary. But the government needed that last effort. And Hollywood helped belt out the message. Get up, get up, get up tomorrow morning. Get down, get down, and give another pint of blood. Get one, get ten, get fifty victory bonds again. For you can win the war that way. When you're safe at home this evening from the factory, you can write that lonely soldier overseas. You can tell him that you're working at the factory, but compared to him, you live a life of ease. So you better get on, get on, get on the road to victory. Get off, get off, get off the road.